If you control who gets to practice a profession, you also get to control how it's practiced. The licensure effort, that's an attempt to silence CrossFit on the subject of nutrition and exercise. The state legislature that would adopt a statewide licensure program for exercise is composed of people who do not understand anything about the squat. The federal government has designed this food pyramid. For the past three decades, almost everything the federal government has told the public about eating a healthy diet may have been wrong. The nutrition guidelines that were set in the late 1970s, it was primarily politics. When it comes to calories, fat is the enemy. The Surgeon General told Americans to avoid saturated fat and prioritize grains and other carbohydrates. Low-fat products began filling the aisles at grocery stores as families tried to follow the government's famous food pyramid. At its base are foods like breads and pastas that should be eaten in greatest quantity. As obesity continued to climb in America, some dissenting scientists and experts began to question the consensus but the U.S. government and major health organizations were slow to react, only just now beginning to update their recommendations. And some fitness professionals are afraid that what happened to the field of nutrition is about to happen to exercise. All of these government agencies, all of our universities, they've all sat silent through one of the worst declines in health that modern world's ever seen. And their response is still, is still exactly wrong. Greg Glassman is the founder of CrossFit, which is a corporate donor to the nonprofit that publishes Reason. CrossFit has disrupted the personal fitness industry by taking a radically different approach to both nutrition and exercise. In contrast to much of the competition and against the recommendations of many establishment scientists, CrossFit has always emphasized a high-intensity workout and a low-carb diet. The approach has been wildly successful for CrossFit, which went from 13 gyms in 2005 to more than 13,000 across the world today. But Glassman says the rise to the top has entailed near constant battle with the opposition. And so we've made some nice enemies out of a good chunk of the food and beverage industry and all of its clowns that do its bidding. CrossFit's explosive growth was made possible in no small part by the lack of regulation in the fitness industry. While many states require licenses for occupations as innocuous as trimming trees, tending bar, braiding hair, or even arranging flowers, personal trainers can work without government oversight. This arrangement allows CrossFit to have its own certification program that ignores most of the conventional nutrition and exercise advice emanating from government and academic institutions. But over the past several years, competing credentialing organizations have joined together to lobby for government licensure of fitness trainers in several states. That's an attempt to silence CrossFit on the subject of nutrition and exercise. The fight is occurring largely behind the scenes at state legislatures across the country, where licensing laws have been introduced on 26 separate occasions since 2005. But CrossFit supporters have pushed back just as hard, at times showing up in person to speak out against the bills. The one place where CrossFit lost the battle was Washington, D.C., which passed the nation's first fitness trainer licensure law in 2014. Though even that hasn't gone fully into effect. If you control who gets to practice a profession, you also get to control how it's practiced. Russ Green is CrossFit's point man in the fight against government licensure. He says that licensing could kill a program like CrossFit. Are we going to be free to talk to each other about fitness and food? Or is what we can say about them going to be determined by federal and state policy? State licensure is a protection racket and that's all it is. Mark Ripto is a weightlifting coach and author of the book Starting Strength, a program distinct from CrossFit, but which shares certain commonalities, like promoting training with barbells and encouraging movements that aren't approved by establishment players in the fitness industry. The state legislature that would adopt a statewide licensure program for exercise is composed of people who do not understand anything about the squat. Ripto and CrossFit trainers both promote what they call a full squat, which involves dipping below parallel in contrast to the less dramatic squat promoted by the American College of Sports Medicine. So what do you think they will say about our below parallel squat? 
It'll be in the document as a standard of practice that squats cannot be done below parallel. I promise you that. You're removing the ability of the purchaser of the product to determine what he wants to get done in his strength and conditioning program by telling him essentially that he must buy the services of a licensed guy who cannot prescribe below parallel squats because it's illegal now. The interaction or intersection of policy and politics is a very problematic one. Holden McRae, a sports medicine professor at Pepperdine University and a member of a CrossFit gym, says that the government's record on fitness guidance is spotty at best. Establishment fitness began when Frank Shorter won the gold medal in the Olympic marathon in Munich in 1972 and the running boom took off. And then a big shift occurred in the mid-1990s. In 1995, the Surgeon General issued a report that shifted the recommendations away from vigorous activity towards low to moderate intensity and de-emphasized certain fitness markers like strength, agility, speed, power, and coordination, putting most of the focus on cardiorespiratory fitness. The guidelines were adopted by the American Heart Association, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the American College of Sports Medicine. The federal government's national activity guidelines published by Congress recommend 150 minutes of moderate physical activity a week. Moderate physical activity, that requirement probably be satisfied by walking 30 minutes five times a week. Most people do that accidentally. It's very low standard to hold a human being to. Doing yard work or walking slowly around the block, that's not gonna get you there. I'm sorry, you actually have to work hard. The risk reduction for vigorous activity is about two times greater compared to moderate exercise. It was an experiment that was run on the US population with very little evidence to support it, similar to what we had with the dietary guidelines. And I don't think there's enough transparency with conflicts of interest, you know, the involvement of Big Soda, for example. Recent work out of the University of California, San Francisco, has uncovered evidence that the sugar lobby paid off researchers to downplay the link between sugar and heart disease, with the very first paper that placed blame on saturated fat having clear ties to the sugar industry. There's some evidence that the same special interests that used government and universities to influence nutrition science for the past several decades is employing similar tactics in the fitness industry to promote the message, it's lack of physical activity rather than sugar consumption driving obesity. Most of the focus in the popular media and in the scientific press is, oh, they're eating too much, eating too much, eating too much, blaming fast food, uh, blaming sugary drinks, and so on. And there's really virtually no compelling evidence that that in fact is a cause. That's a video from the Global Energy Balance Network, a group forced to disband after its ties to Coca-Cola were revealed. At least one major group involved in the occupational licensing fight has received support from soda company. Coca-Cola did not reply to requests to comment and the American College of Sports Medicine declined to participate in this story. But ACSM's website does say that it only advocates licensure for trainers working with clients with medical conditions that require minimal to advanced clinical support. ACSM's newest venture, Exercises Medicine, is an attempt to create a credentialing system to have doctors prescribe fitness trainers to patients. And it was underwritten by the Coca-Cola company. Even health organizations as powerful and influential as the Centers for Disease Control have received grants from Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola has partnered with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That fact alone is sufficient to explain the degree of the chronic disease crisis that we're facing in this country today. These are 501c3 proxies that are able to keep their doors open by the contributions from soda pop. When you think ACSM, you better be thinking Coca-Cola because that's, that's what you got. The fields of nutrition and fitness are littered with bad or incomplete science that may take years or even decades to sort out. And this is why Ripto and Glassman are skeptical that government can do anything but make the problem worse. The competitive marketplace of people who consume strength and conditioning instruction is capable of sorting this out. Am I happy with my trainer? Did I get stronger? Did I get more fit? These should be the criteria that a competitive marketplace provides for the profession.